I am very happy to welcome to the Professor uh, David Odrich, which is professor who is professor at the University of Indiana. But I think that is not um, necessary to present the Professor David Odrich, which is very known. Everybody knows the works of David Odrich about the entrepreneurial society and about the, the study of the link between the university and the uh, and entrepreneurship. For example, I have in my office two important uh, books. The first one is the Entrepreneurial Society, which is, uh, I think, an important contribution of the um, of um, an historical analysis about the evolution of the um, capitalist uh, system and how we are now in an um, entrepreneurial society, which is very uh, innovative and creative. I have always in my um, in my office, uh, another important book was, uh, which was edited by David Odrech and uh, Albert um, Link about university and entrepreneurial uh, ecosystem. So with these two books, I think that it is a good introduction for the um, for the conference of uh, David uh, Odrech. So you have uh, 30 minutes uh, for um, your contribution and after we will have time for discussion and debate. So you, thank you very much. Well, <clears throat> thank you very much, Sophie, for, and, and Blund, uh, Blundine too, for the very kind introduction. I will share my screen that, um, You can't see that, can you? No. No, not for the moment. Okay, I try again. And now I share again. Ah, voila. Bravo. Yeah, très bien. Okay, great. And now you can see. Yeah, thank you, as I said, uh, to Sophie and, and Blondine for the very kind invitation, for the opportunity uh, to join you. Although uh, Blondine and I were talking, this is kind of disappointing. Uh, uh, your introduction makes me really miss Paris and want to be there to see the Eiffel Tower in the beautiful river and the beautiful ambience of Paris, but uh, you know we've learned with Zoom, this is the second, this is the second best uh, thing. So thank you very much. I spent my, um, I spent the decade of the 1970s getting my bachelor's, my master's, my doctorate. You know these three famous degrees now across Europe the bachelor's, the master's, the doctorate. And that's what I did in the 1970s. Um, and what I remember when I look back was that the, the, the professors, it didn't matter which department or which school, they all did the same thing. They all had the same teaching responsibility, a certain number of courses. They all had the same research uh, responsibilities. And they all had the same you could say valorization or the same uh, uh, service they were expected to do, administer uh, the, the university. And nobody, and you know, nobody talked about the impact of the university at all on the city or the state or the country. And you might think, oh, where could I have possibly gone to university? I went to the University of Wisconsin, which is a public university a state university and has and had at that time a mandate, a requirement, because it's paid for by the by the, the state, the taxpayers, to have a positive impact on society. But back then, nobody thought in terms of what we hear today about technology transfer or innovation or having an impact. In fact, what I remember, there was like a, a wall like the beautiful medieval castles I visit in France, uh, unfortunately not for a year and a half uh, in the 
uh, the, this wall protecting the university from society, and in a way protecting society from the university. And this was really still the model of what's been called the Humboldt University. Uh, that's, but it wasn't just the University of Wisconsin. I think it was every university in the United States and pretty much around the world uh, adhered to this Humboldt model of a university. And von Humboldt was a great scholar and scientist and statesman uh, working and living in Berlin. And uh, uh, his great accomplishment, among other things, was to free and liberate the university from the dictates, the, the, the authority of the church and of the state, of the government. So we go back in time before then, we know that the universities were controlled by the church and by governments. So when, for example, um, um, Copernicus made his important discovery that the earth revolves around the sun, rather than the sun revolving around the earth. The church didn't like Copernicus. They put him into a dungeon. They, to he was to they tortured him. He was lucky to live. I mean, if you went against the authorities of either the church or the government at the university, the university was subservient. So what the Humboldt model, what von Humboldt did was to free the university from being a servant of governments and churches to being free and independent to pursue, and we all know this phrase, knowledge for its own sake. Knowledge for its own sake compared to the sake of what would serve the government or the church. There was freedom and independence of research and teaching. You know, we kind of, I think in the modern world, we just assume that. But what that meant was, what that means today we don't need the approval of governments and churches to research or teach what we did. At the same time, there was little uh, uh, expectation of engaging with society or providing value for society because the arbiter of value was the university itself, was the academic discipline. So what was valuable in philosophy was determined by the philosophy uh, professors, what was valuable in ancient Greek, I suppose, was valued not by governments or churches, but by or society, but by the, the the professors, the academics themselves. And what's interesting to me, at least, that hadn't really changed that much when I got to the University of Wisconsin. Uh, there wasn't this expectation that the university contributes or impacts society, and that's because I the the when I got there to the university we were still in the second industrial era, uh, which was the era of, let's see, of, um, uh, of, of what determined performance of companies, of, uh, of cities, of regions, was essentially having factories and workers work in those factories, whether it was at the, the, for the company, uh, famous studies by Alfred Chandler had, had documented that, an MIT uh, scholar, or for countries or provinces or for cities, those countries or cities that did well were countries that or cities that had the physical, had factories. So we know in the United States, it was actually Detroit in the auto industry. When I was uh, a student back at Wisconsin, Detroit was still the richest city in the United States, probably the, the world. Uh, why it had great factories, great industry, and had lots of workers to work in those factories. That was the second industrial. Everybody knows about the first one, uh, which was about, of course, the steam engine and so on. Uh, at some point uh, in the 1960s, I mean, these are just approximate dates. I got this from Wikipedia or something, um, but, um, uh, this gave way to what they called the third industrial era, which was about uh, computerization, but more subtly a shift to innovation driven society, partly because with this technology, 
We also had what we now call globalization so that we still use, consume manufactured goods. We're wearing clothes, we're using computers. Computers may be thought up in the advanced world, but we know they're manufactured in um, typically in Asia. Uh, uh, automobiles, we consume uh, uh, household products. They tend to be manufactured somewhere else so that the competitiveness of companies and of cities like Paris, for example, or France or New Zealand or Japan depend more and more on innovation, which is driven by um, uh, ideas. And then of course, now we're in this fourth industrial era, which they say was ushered in by the Hanover Mesa, the Hanover trade show, something like 2013, 2014, which is about um, uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning, maybe. Uh, 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 who knows? But I, I do know that um, when I went to the university was, um, was in the second industrial era, uh, I have, uh, uh, well, was, was in the third industrial era, but it was right after the second one. So everything I learned was really reflected ideas and thinking from the second industrial era. Now we have the third one. And I think, oh, that's probably my qualification to give this talk. I've experienced the second industrial era, the third, the fourth, if I were just a little bit older, maybe I would have experienced all four industrial eras. Um, anyway, you know, the university in a, in a society, an economy where competitiveness, whether you're a company or a, a city, depends on factories and unskilled labor, is not really much of a role for the university. I mean, universities don't create factories, they don't operate factories, they don't generate unskilled labor. It was about brawn or physical strength, not brains. And we can see this going all the way back to what mattered was what Karl Marx mattered, said mattered. Look at the title of his famous book, Capital, Das Capital. It's the same capital that we, uh, uh, that, that really mattered throughout this whole second industrial era. So for the universities, it just did not have a contribution to make in terms of contributing to factories or in contributing to unskilled labor. Um, it, uh, uh, it may have made a contribution in terms of social value, in terms of uh, 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 values in society, civic, uh, civic engagement in terms of democracy, but only in terms of limited in terms of how well places did. So for example, Detroit, Pittsburgh in the United States, they did not have great universities at all. The great universities tended to be in Boston, um, and which was not particularly a thriving place. There was not a, a link between universities and the place. And there we see, oh yeah, that's from the cover of the book. Sophie showed that kindly enough, and I took the cover just to that. I worked at a factory because I am a child of the second industrial era. I didn't work in a wheel factory, but that's what factories looked at. Unskilled workers with machinery or with, we say, physical capital. And we know what's happened. I took this from The Economist um, to manufacturing in the last um, this is about 50 years, right? If you look at that blue line, that's the share of employment in the United States in manufacturing. It's gone down and down and down and down and down. And why is that? Because of this shift to the third industrial era, which is not just about technology, but it's really about globalization as well. So that yes, we consume manufactured goods, but because of globalization, those goods tend to be outsourced and offshored and produced in lower cost uh, uh, regions or countries outside of Europe or New Zealand or Australia or Japan. They tend to be produced more in Asia um, or uh, uh, perhaps in Mexico or someplace like that. So we can see uh, the change of wages of different types of workers over time. Uh, this is for the United States from 1963 until about a decade ago. And we can see the, um, the um, blue line 
is for people with a degree more than the highest level of human capital, more than a bachelor's degree. The orange line is for people with a bachelor's degree. And then the lower three lines are for the bottom line is high school dropouts, high school graduates, and then uh, 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 people with some college. And I think everybody knows this story, but it's to me, it's instructive. Because I remember back in the second industrial era, which I'm a child of, I remember in high school, people saying, you know, you might want to go to university, but that is for, it will polish you off. It will make you a more worldly person, but it's not going to help you earn more income. You can see it in the data. I remember factory workers earned, it wasn't just in the US, I have the, the data for the US. This was true in every European country. There was this equal income distribution, we can see it. And what we see since then, especially when, since we enter this third industrial era, you know, around 19, the end of the 60s, we can see this um, uh, divergence of returns to work. People with human capital earn a lot more. They're the ones with ideas and can work with ideas in every sense of the word. They can work with emotional intelligence. They can communicate. People who tend to have low human capital, we can see that they're, um, uh, in real terms, their incomes have gone down and down and down. So we see this big gap. And what that means is that the role of the university starts to shift in this third industrial era, which is roughly right as I started the university in 1972, my first year in college or the university, it was triggered by, um, uh, in the United States, but it was really all throughout the developed countries, what they call the competitiveness crisis of the 1970s. But if we go back and look at this, what that means is that before, until about 1970, uh, uh, manufacturing was doing pretty well in Europe, in North America, Australia, and so on. That meant the wage gap was not very big um, uh, going in the 1950s and 1960s. But in the 1970s, as this new technology uh, of computerization uh, uh, took hold, but also what we call now globalization, the industries that have been as successful, automobiles, textiles, clothing, uh, all kinds of industries suffered this competitiveness crisis. But what people started to observe is that the industries that were doing well, pharmaceuticals, uh, uh, electronics, they were industries that needed ideas that were innovative. And the university starts to emerge. You know, where does the ideas come from? They come from the university. I remember this. Uh, some of you may remember the movie. The movie's pretty dated. I think it came out in eh, the mid 90s, I guess. Um, the mid 90s. Michael Crichton, the author, wrote the book in 1990. And if you actually read the book, uh, uh, he starts the book by saying, 1990, he writes this. So he's really writing in the 1980s. He writes something like biochemistry used to be an irrelevant, archaic, academic topic, better left to the uh, uh, professors in the ivory tower wearing their tweed jackets and, you know, unimportant. And then he says, one day it became valuable, meaning uh, 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 society started to, or scientists started to figure out a use for it which is actually then the motivation for the, for the book and the movie, because of course the DNA becomes valuable for the dinosaurs. But that's kind of what happened, not just to dinosaur DNA, but to lots of the knowledge at universities as society changes really throughout Europe, throughout the developed countries, the OECD countries, there's this shift from physical capital to ideas. That's what drives competitiveness. So we see a shift from the firms like General Motors or Renault. Uh, Renault is is a um, that that's a French firm, firm, isn't it? Renault, the auto company, right? Yeah. Uh, we see a shift from the auto companies we, uh, to the uh, 
uh, pharmaceutical companies, computer companies, into software companies, electronic companies. In terms of places, we see a shift from uh, Detroit to California, to Boston, where the knowledge is, or we see a shift in, say, in Europe, from the Ruhr Valley of um, near Cologne and the Ruhr Valley to the where the knowledge is, uh, uh, which is the universities, the ideas down in Munich, uh, for example, into Paris. There's the shift going on. It's not just for companies, it's for places, but also for people. And we can see it here. There's a shift going on from people who can work with their physically, with their bodies, their hands, to people who can work with ideas. So the university starts to become, society starts to look and it's in this crisis, where are ideas? And of course, ideas are in, 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 in research and development company, laboratories of companies. They're in education of, of high school, uh, but they're in gymnasium, but they're also at universities. And I experienced this in the 1980s and 1990s as the university, the view of it starts to become not just knowledge for knowledge's sake, but at the bottom, I say demand oriented. Knowledge is valued because it can, it can provide answers where there's a demand, both for profit, but also for societal problems as well. So uh, it seems like then, okay, the universities are the, the solution to this, one of the solutions to this third industrial era. And I remember going to Stockholm, um, yeah, it would have been in the 1990s, and stock in Sweden, like a lot of the European countries, was bogged down with economic stagnation, unemployment rising up. And they had a little conference at the Ministry of Economics, what should Sweden do? And I marched into Stockholm and I said, oh, I know, because we've now, I didn't use these words, but I essentially said, we've left the second industrial era where factories matter so that the great Swedish cities making the great manufactured products like Saab, uh, autos, uh, for example, uh, or uh, uh, that had now uh, in, in cities like Trollhead and, and the manufacturing heartland of Sweden, that had shifted to now knowledge. And so Sweden had to invest in universities and human capital and culture more generally because that drives creativity of people. And I remember that the host, the minister that they said, well, Mr. Audrich, we've invested in all those things. All of the OECD international measures show Sweden number one or two in terms of human capital education, in terms of research and development, in terms of educational levels, in terms of patents, patents per capita per company. And yet we still have this stagnant growth in this unemployment. And that was the first day I heard of the what they called the Swedish paradox. And the paradox was, they seem to be investing in knowledge, which we need for innovation, but they weren't getting the innovation. That was the paradox. And they weren't getting the, the benefits, which would be the jobs, the growth, the competitiveness. Romano Prodi, who was president of the, of the European Union at that time, around 2000, he was so taken by this, he then took it to, to reflect uh, uh, Europe and called it the European paradox. And slowly what we start to realize, knowledge doesn't automatically, it's not automatically commercialized, whether it's from a company or from a university, just because there's research, there's human capital, there's knowledge, doesn't mean it's automatically translated into innovations, into jobs, growth, competitiveness, but rather there's this, um, the, what we call the, the knowledge filter, which is this kind of barrier almost like a wall between the knowledge and then the, the innovation. And of course, uh, Romano Prodi, as I mentioned, the president of the EU said famously in 2002, he said, our lacuna, that means our lack in the field of entrepreneurship needs to be taken seriously because there's mounting evidence that the key to economic growth and productivity improvements lies in the entrepreneurial capacity of an economy. The, just two years earlier, the, the Lisbon, the Council of Europe meeting in Lisbon, the famous Lisbon Council of Europe, had made a mandate to make Europe the knowledge leader in the world, but also the entrepreneurship leader. Why was that? It was because of this knowledge 
filter. Now, I didn't have to go to Europe to see the knowledge filter. I could have seen it in my own country, the United States. A US senator said back in 1980, a wealth of scientific talent at American colleges and universities, talent responsible for the development of numerous innovative scientific breakthroughs each year is going to waste as a result of bureaucratic red tape and illogical uh, government uh, regulations. Well, nobody's in favor of that. And then he goes on to, say, to ask, what sense does it make to spend billions of dollars each year on government supported research and then prevent new developments from benefiting the American people because of dumb bureaucratic red tape? So together with a colleague, uh, Senator Dole, they passed the famous Spy Dole Act, which was the purpose was to penetrate this knowledge filter out of the university. Now that was caused by, he said, dumb bureaucratic red tape bureaucracy. It basically meant the federal agencies owned the intellectual property from any research that was funded by the Environmental Protection Agency, the National Science Foundation. So to commercialize, to make an invention, the, uh, the, 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 the scientist or the, had to get the approval of the Environmental Protection Agency or the National Science Foundation. That's, and of course, that's a big bureaucratic mess. That's why they created the Bayh-Dole Act to shift the, the property rights, intellectual property rights from the federal government to the university. The universities responded by creating technology transfer offices, uh, but not to get bogged down by the details, uh, the whole point was to penetrate this knowledge filter. And in some ways, this was a response to what Sophie mentioned in the introduction to that in the third industrial era, after the, the computers and the technological change, uh, uh, entrepreneurship was became the driving force shaping economic performance, really two ingredients knowledge, but then entrepreneurship to get those ideas out of the companies or out of the universities into, uh, into society. I mean, if you think about, it doesn't really matter which famous invention, we could say the invention or the, the innovation of, the, of, the, of Facebook, right? I mean, where was that research? Or where was the knowledge created? Everybody knows it was created at the university in a dormitory. Zuckerberg and his friends created this but they couldn't commercialize it, make the innovation at the university. They had to for, start a new company, Facebook. We see the same thing with um, Apple Computer. Those, that research in, th those inventions were created at Xerox in, a, lab, in a, a, a research park. It took the entrepreneurship to get the ideas out of the laboratory, out into society. So what the entrepreneurial economy was observing is that those companies, those cities, those provinces, those countries with more entrepreneurship, they tend to exhibit a stronger economic performance in terms of jobs, sustainability, growth, and competitiveness. But it takes more than having entrepreneurial people or companies. It takes institutions, cultures, um, culture and policies that are conducive to an entrepreneurial economy. And that's what the entrepreneurial society is. So what the entrepreneurial university then evolved to is a university, not just that creates knowledge from the research and development in human capital, but facilitates the knowledge spillovers from the university out into society. That's a shift from the Humboldt model. Remember where knowledge is for knowledge sake, and the arbiters of knowledge are the disciplines themselves, the university becomes an, a solution provider where it provides solutions to problems, needs of society, rather than knowledge for knowledge its own sake, it's knowledge because the ideas have value in society, either commercial value or, com or value dealing with societal problems. With this, we see a lot of, uh, like the technology transfer office, lots of different, I say conduits, but really they're agencies, organizations, parts of universities, either inside or outside, to help facilitate 
the spillover of knowledge, this very expensive knowledge that's created at universities to help get it out. Uh, uh, so incubators, science parks, uh, uh, in the United States, they call it sponsored research. I think all around the world now we see lots and lots of these uh, mechanisms, not just to create knowledge, but to get it to spill over. So this is what the entrepreneurial university looks like. And at its core, we can see the Humboldt University. It still exists, kind of like, you know, the child still exists in each of us. The Humboldt University has these elements uh, or it reflects those elements of universities where knowledge is valued because for its own sake, we would see that in philosophy, probably ancient Greek, um, probably um, theoretical physics. What makes that knowledge valuable is the discipline says it's valuable. It's not that it's valuable to society uh, uh, necessarily, but around that grew a circle of, uh, that's the second ring, which we could call applied knowledge or from applied research. And that's knowledge because it's going to be valued by society. You know, is philosophy valued by society? Probably not directly. But we know that um, biochemistry is valued by companies want it. Or we know that, um, say, the vaccination that people are putting into their arms from the pandemic. Many university uh, medical schools and research laboratories have been working on that. That was not knowledge for its own sake. Those scientists were not engaged in, in the COVID research three years ago. It just didn't have any value. Now it has tremendous value. Why? Because society values it uh, uh, in, you know, in obvious ways. So we could say that a lot, of the, um, a lot of the vaccination research, for example, that's not knowledge for its own sake. That's knowledge to actually help society. I mean, it's valued by society. And in that ring, we put things like a lot of us work at business schools. Business schools are not, I remember Oxford University, Cambridge University. In fact, when I was at the University of Wisconsin in the 1970s, uh, business schools were barely tolerated on university campuses. Why? Because the university was primarily that central ring, the Humboldt University. Business schools are not about knowledge for its own sake, but knowledge to help business possibly society, but that violates the humble university. It belongs in the second ring. Now we see lots and lots of interdisciplinary programs that are, they're interdisciplinary because they draw in to that middle ring. They pull out bits of, from different basic disciplines. They say business schools draw on um, sociology, psychology, and economics. Three basic disciplines about knowledge for its own sake they take that knowledge, mix it up to try to provide solutions that are also understandable and usable to constituents, to the demanders, which would be businesses um, largely. And that's typical of, of a field in that second ring. I would call those fields like biochemistry or informatics, which I, I, don't, I don't understand any of these, but apparently that's computational applications for lots of different fields, it's driven by the need. That third ring is about the mechanisms to help get that knowledge out. It's not enough just to have the knowledge, the ideas, the journals, the research. It's got to be made or to have an impact. It's, it's made more user-friendly by offices of technology transfer, science parks, incubators. Um, this is where all of those kind of mechanisms go in that third ring. And then outside the university are, we could call it absorptive capacity mechanisms. Those could be companies that locate close to universities to absorb the knowledge, or it could be public uh, agencies. Every country has them uh, to help take that knowledge out of the university and then uh, uh, link it up to firms and individuals and this is so you would, I would never want to say all aspects of the uni entrepreneurial university are focused on entrepreneurship. I would say the entrepreneurship, entrepreneurial university builds on or extends 
the traditional Humboldt University to uh, facilitate the spillover of knowledge that's coming from those very expensive uh, 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 investments in knowledge. So the university has become more complex uh, and includes aspects of the Humboldt University, uh, applied knowledge, spillover mechanisms, all to facilitate knowledge spillovers that drive entrepreneurship. And we can see, I mean, why do the universities do it? I, I kind of glossed through it because I don't want to talk about it. But for some universities, they this is a millions of dollars. We can see there's a lot of license, a lot of revenue generated through licensing. There's Columbia, Northwestern, Stanford, MIT. It's pretty skewed though. Most universities don't make, you know, this is just a, a handful. Um, we can see that the technology transfer from the United States, uh, this is a long period, a 20 year period, has had a tremendous uh, impact on the economy. So it's estimated $1.3 trillion, it's a lot of money, a um, lot of jobs, 4.3 million jobs, a lot of pens. That's the uh, impact of the commercialization of, of knowledge. So the new roles for the entrepreneurial university come in contrast to the university I went to, uh, a lot of people, I think, mistakenly think, oh, that's an American phenomena. I went to the university in America. There was nothing unusual about the University of Wisconsin. American universities were humble models for universities until about, they start to shift in the 1980s. <clears throat> so the entrepreneurial university uh, uh, has one of its functions, not its only function, is to spawn knowledge spillover entrepreneurship. That is facilitate the spillover of knowledge that was used to as an input for entrepreneurship. It also though, contributes to changes in culture of a place because in the entrepreneurial society, there's a different culture that's needed than in that second industrial divide a second industrial era, which is the era I grew up in. Uh, uh, I'm a product. I remember that industrial era where the focus, the socialization, the education of people was to go work in assembly line, mass production, factory jobs. Once we get into an entrepreneurial society, there's a different type of characteristics of people to be autonomous, to be in, in independent, to be creative, it takes a different type of ent capital, a social capital that I would call entrepreneurship capital. And then the third role is to provide thought leadership uh, for the entrepreneurial society. That is to provide uh, 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 leadership for uh, entrepreneurs in entrepreneurial organizations. So to conclude, I'll just say the entrepreneurial society emerged as a response to the third industrial era because it turned out it's more than about more than knowledge. It's about uh, uh, having people act on that knowledge and get it out into society. The university, the entrepreneurial university is a key institution and it evolved from being irrelevant extraneous in the second industrial era to becoming a key uh, institution as a, as a catalyst for entrepreneurial activity uh, by providing a source of, when I say entrepreneurship capital, I really mean social capital, cultural capital. <clears throat> um, uh, now, there's also some negative aspects. Every change has positives and negatives, but I will stop with the positives and perhaps somebody can ask me about the negatives. Thank you very much. Thank you very much uh, for your presentation, which was uh, very uh, interesting, and especially with this uh, historical uh, evolution of the um, of the university in the um, in the capitalist society. The, tomorrow we had a, a conference about the French system with the with the university is very concentrated and um, uh, is not in fact very um, innovative. So with your presentation, we have another aspect of the uh, evolution of the entrepreneurial uh, university. 
So I think that now there are a lot of people who have, uh, do you have any question to David Odresh? No? I see Theodore Leiber. Yes, we have. I can, I can try to put a question forward or make a comment, so to say. No, make the, make the comment. Yeah, please. Uh, you, you showed this, uh, say, onion model or circle model uh, at the core, the hum Humboldt University, and then the outer layers uh, until the entrepreneurial aspects come into play. My question is, is this... Uh, an abstract model for you, or is it really a, a, a real structural model for real universities? Or put it another way, um, do you think that every university, and there are many different types of them, at least in Germany, uh, every university should be an entrepreneurial one in the onion or circle model? model or do you think uh, there are different possibilities to arrange these things? It's a, it's a great thoughtful question, Theodor, which is, first of all, is this kind of theoretical? And I would say it's actually the opposite. It's a, it's a way to interpret uh, what I've experienced in my life. I'm not even sure it's theoretical. It's the way I've seen, say, the, um, the Technical University of Munich go from being a... Um, kind of a small, almost Fachhochschule, uh, which is a kind of a, a professional uh, engineering school to becoming one of the global uh, powerhouses of universities. Why is that? Because it always had this core, uh, uh, but it was able to expand to applied research and then to, uh, to having uh, commercialization, having licenses, patents in entrepreneurship, it wasn't just, it didn't just happen. It took, I remember in about the year uh, 2004, 2005, the Technical University of Munich changed its brand. They made it the brand. They called themselves the Entrepreneurial University. Same thing if you go to Cambridge or Oxford, they resisted business schools. I mentioned that. Then they resisted being entrepreneurial. It was deemed outside of the proper role of a university. But that's no different than in my own country, the United States, even MIT, which some people might say is maybe the most entrepreneurial university. I've heard people uh, say, older than me, say, oh, back in the 1950s and 1960s, you would get fired if you got involved in commercialization. That's not what a university is about. Now, then your, your next part of the question is, you know, does this mean every university is going to be an entrepreneurial university? And I think the answer is, Absolutely not. In some ways, what this does is to um, identify different roles of an ecosystem. And Theodore, when you mentioned Germany, you know, I think a lot of people underestimate how entrepreneurial those universities are. And also their research, it's not the universities, but I would say more the, the lender, the provinces or the country, because they tend to measure universities but in fact, what's relevant is, a, is an ecosystem. So to be specific, what it means is Germany has these famous research organizations like the Max Planck Society or the Fraunhofer Society. Those are both doing research. They're actually not at the universities. Sometimes they partner with the universities. They're providing the Max Planck a little more of the basic, the Fraunhofer a little bit more of the applied. So in that sense, what we see is a specialization, which I think is an old tradition uh, uh, in, on the continent, that said the universities are involved more of the teaching and the research institutes are more involved in the research. Uh, I, I think it's a great research area to look at what the management organization should be. Is it better to have them organizationally separated or is it better to have vertical integration? But my final comment is one thing we know, it's empirical. We've seen this. We've seen this evolution where more and more of the universities are trying to be. They're almost like conglomerates. They're trying to provide basic uh, uh, research, applied research, uh, and then the knowledge spillovers. Uh, now, whether that's the optimal form, time will tell. 
Thank you. Thank you very much. We have two other questions from uh, Daniele to begin um, after uh, Blandin and Arwin. So, Daniele. Hello, 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 David. Lovely to see you online. And thank you to everybody for, for the organization. I mean, uh, um, I, I got, uh, uh, we have seen in recent, in recent uh, months uh, that universities contributed quite a lot of knowledge uh, for something which is very, very important for all of us, uh, namely vaccines for COVID-19, you know? And indeed, uh, this uh, knowledge base uh, was also fundamentally funded by the public sector in the United States, in Germany, less in other European countries, but there was a, a major commitment of public money in order to help universities uh, to develop this knowledge together with business corporations. At the end, uh, now we are, got, uh, we are stuck uh, because uh, in some parts of the, of the, of the, the world, uh, this knowledge uh, is not uh, available uh, to everybody. And for example, we still have a shortage of vaccines, not so much in the United States, uh, but in many parts of the developing world. So how do you think that uh, an entrepreneurial university can address this problem? Well, Danielle, it's, uh, it's wonderful to see you. What happened to you? You used to be so young. <laughs> I'm so still you think I, Yeah, there you go. So you think that happened to me. But your question is, is really great. And you know, there, there's two components that uh, I really want to highlight. The first kind of connects to the previous question, which is the universities uh, uh, are, and they become, you know, in, in the Humboldt model, the universities were not instruments for industrial policy or public policy because they were extraneous. They were on the margin of the economy in society. I mean, they, they contributed a role for sure, but not, in, not to the economy, not the way it, it's been for, for a generation. Uh, so the interesting question is, as the universities become important, to what degree do they become instruments for policy? Now, I think this is more of, uh, you know, we, do you remember, Danielle, our friend Zoltan Ach? Yes, yes, of course. I remember him very well. I, I continue to, 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 to follow you. It's bright. Yes. Well, he said famously once, he said, he said, ideas either end debates or start debates. And I think, you know, Danielle, you've had many ideas uh, that have done both. Uh, but I think it's, 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 we don't really know to what degree our universities, to, to what extent are they instruments of industrial, what we used to call industrial policy, right, Daniel, back in the day. Now we just call it policy. But I do know this, in my country, the United States, where there's a, a vacuum of industrial policy, there's not a lot of policy instruments. We don't, have, we don't have a lot of the mechanisms to implement policy from governments. So they tend to use the universities. You just mentioned an example for the COVID vaccination. Now it hooks up to the previous question, that says, well, if we don't have Fraunhofer Institutes and Max Planck Institutes and all kinds of other mechanisms, apprentice systems, um, uh, then in my country, the universities get burdened with more and more of the, um, of the responsibilities, but also the resources to provide solutions. Now, is that optimal? Is it good? I'm not gonna say, all I'm doing is interpreting simply on, you know, how the world's changed from when you and I were young, but we can feel this spread around the world. Not that long ago, meaning 10 years ago, I was in Japan giving a talk along these lines and somebody in the audience said, oh yes, we've got a Baidol Act in Japan. And I asked, oh, that's great. What do you call it? And they looked at me and said, the Baidol Act of Japan. I mean, this is diffused <laughs> around the world. Your last point though, is there's a problem uh, globally, which is to address the pandemic, not just in the each country, but to address it globally. I, you know, it's a great question. I'll do, I should just leave it that, but I'll say my sense of universities is they're globalizing all. Of, now, now, not every university, for sure, but many of the great universities, 
University of Rome, University of, um, of Paris are globalizing. I mean, just for sure, the, uh, uh, the I mentioned the Technical University of, of Munich in all kinds of ways. And what that means is the ways that they try to impact society extends way beyond their towns, their cities, their provinces, their countries. And I think this has become normal. Whether you look at London School of Economics or Oxford University, they try to have global impact. So an implication is if they want to have a global impact and get the recognition, but also the resources, they may be the was partly the instrument to help solve the pandemic uh, uh, you know, in, around the world. I think we're seeing this more and more. It kind of morphs into, which is the, the, pre, you know, the first part, what are the universities for? Who are the constituencies and who pays for it? Um, I don't have answers to any of those. My only simple observation is, you know what, Danielle, in our lifetimes, it's changed tremendously and it's changed every place. I'm sure it'll keep changing. I think this is a very important topic. That's all I'll say. Uh, thank you very much for your answer. We have also another question for, for from Arwind. Arwind, you, you can... Uh, right, right. I, thought, I thought Blondine was before me, but, but uh, I'll go for... You have a question too, Blondine? Yes, uh, Blondine, so... <laughs> Yes, yes uh, Arvid could begin, of course, no problem, I can, uh, <laughs> I can wait. <laughs> but well, okay, I begin so, so that not to, to take uh, too much time. Um, I was also very happy to see Daniele, he has disappeared now, but <laughs> uh, thank you for, for being uh, with us, Daniele. <laughs> uh, I, I just... I didn't want to look too old, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Well, I just wanted to, to comment and, and first thanks a lot for, for this very insightful presentation. And I wanted to comment on the last slide when uh, uh, it's written, uh, entrepreneurial uh, university serves as a catalyst for entre entrepreneurial activity by providing source of entrepreneurship capital. As for me, in my research, I'm working on knowledge capital, firms knowledge capital. This is uh, uh, I mean, uh, the, the way firm produce, um, firms produce, uh, capture, appropriate, and transform knowledge into innovation, in fact, into produ products, services, uh, organiz new organizations, and so on. So um, I would say, and I, I would like to know if you agree with me, uh, that entrepreneurial university serves as a catalyst for the knowledge capital of companies, of firms' knowledge capital. That is uh, how science uh, is uh, not only appropriated, as it was the case already uh, at the time of uh, Marx, <laughs> um, but uh, not only appropriated, but orientated. That, that is to say that the, the entrepreneurial university uh, contribute to define the ways uh, where to search, in fact, and uh, useful research for companies. So that's, and I, I wanted to know how do you define entrepreneurship capital? Is it different or what, what do you mean uh, uh, compared to my comment? <laughs> Thank you. No, Blondine, I, I really appreciate that your thoughtfulness and your reflections. I can see you've really been uh, doing research and thinking about this link between uh, innovation, companies, and then the university and you know in some ways you ask me uh about the meaning of these words like entrepreneurship right you say well is this uh, for, you know for me um of course uh i was someplace before the pandemic i think i was in montpelier and i started up and saying well as my former president george bush said the trouble with the french is they have no word for entrepreneur and everybody laughed and then somebody in the audience said, oh, no, it's true because it means something. But, you know, we don't even know in the field what it means. It means different things to different people. And I guess I, I, I like to be in research areas where these concepts are very elastic. So 
I, I do think there's different modes of commercializing. So from research at universities, so uh, licensing, is that entrepreneurship? Eh, is is you know, patents, is that entrepreneurship? We know that strictly speaking, provided the knowledge for entrepreneurial companies. Yeah, I think now I'm kind of gone around in a circle. I'm probably most comfortable with this sense of there's a different role, which is the universities trying to fuel entrepreneurship very broadly considered in society. So I guess I'm French too. I, I don't know what French entrepreneurship is, but it's good that way, right? Um, but I, I know it's, I, I think what's, yes, the words matter, but what's really important in these questions have all uncovered that is the function of the university. And you're clearly looking on that. I know the words we put on though, they do matter um, a lot. Um, uh, uh, but um, uh, I, one thing for sure, the role of the university has changed. Nobody's asked really, uh, uh, is this good? But I think there's a lot of negative aspects and we hear this a lot. For example, the humble model functions of the university, knowledge for its own sake, that can become threatened uh, in a way by the outer circles can kind of almost like cancer can kind of start to attack the inner circle. And to keep that balance, either at the university or in an ecosystem, thinking of, of say Germany, where there's an ecosystem between the research institutes, the maybe the, the Fachhochschule or the universities, um, it, it, that, that balance has to be preserved. So I, I like the question better than my answer, Blondina. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. At the end of your presentation, you you spoke very quickly about the negative aspect of the development of the um, entrepreneurial university. But um, now I would like to to ask to Arvin for this question. Right. Uh, so thanks. Thanks. Um, <laughs> okay. So my my question is um, coming from a development studies background. Uh, you have the pre I mean, you were going in this direction, and then, and, but there's something more. Uh, since you've already thought about how the university is related to the third revolution, I want to know how do you think it'll change with the fourth revolution? And especially, what poor countries do to skip this third revolution, which you know they're probably too late for? Can they directly go into the fourth? And I'm not talking about India. I'm talking about uh, Congo, or Sudan, or South Sudan, or whatever. You know, poor countries can they gear the university to directly try to take advantage of the fourth revolution? What kind of basic infrastructure should they provide or mindsets? Well, I don't know if you've thought about it. Thanks. Um, no, I I haven't. Um, uh, but I, I it's a great question, and it, I think it kind of couples with some of the other questions, which says it's about the organization of knowledge and commercialization, not just, I mean, in some ways, I think a limitation of what I've been thinking about is I look at the university in isolation as if it's the only knowledge creator in, in an ecosystem, we'll say this. But what you just said and some of the other questions is, no, actually, it's part of a, an ecosystem. Now, most of us tend to think of locally, but you know what you just did was to kind of make it more global. And then that allows for specialization. And your question really makes me think of, and we've seen this a lot in the third industrial era, the, that in the development context, firms, individuals can leapfrog the arc of development mm -hmm. and, and, and leapfrog it up considerably through specialization. I think this is a big issue for universities and knowledge, and it gets to the basic research. The inner circle seems to create value that the outer circles need, but the opportunity, or in some ways, because it's a public good, nobody wants to pay for it. This is an issue. So one issue is who's gonna pay for those those traditional fields and research that adds value. 
And then from a strategy, whether it's in a developing context or any context, is, is almost a, not what we call the free rider problem, but it's a, a strategy that says, let other agency uh, institutions, maybe in different country contexts, let them undertake the costly basic research. And then we will be involved with the kind of the cutting edge. Uh, uh, I think we're seeing that strategy uh, right now happen. Not so much, I haven't thought about the developmental context, but I think what we learned from the third industrial era, looking at countries like India, but also uh, uh, the, the East Asian tigers, is that they were able to leapfrog very successfully by, uh, by making themselves complementary to these global value chains in a, you could say a global ecosystem. It's a great question though. And I'm sure you've got thoughts on it as well. Uh, thank you very much. We have a last uh, question from the, the chat. Uh, it is uh, Marcos who um, asks you, what is the role of entrepreneurship education in the entrepreneurial in university? The role oh, yeah. Is that Marcus who asked that question? Yes. Yes. I love, I love that question because once again, to me, it's, I'm looking backwards in my life. And in this entrepreneurial economy, in the 1990s, really, in the 80s, and we, collectively in society, start to rec recognize, oh, entrepreneurship is important. We start to provide entrepreneurship education. And we do it in a ghetto. We do it for people who think they want to be entrepreneurs, which is some very small minority, still minority of the population. We either do it in business schools, but it's not respected in business schools, uh, or we do it outside business schools. But it's almost just to provide tools for people who like how to write a business plan and the rest of it. Then what we see, though, is that is, is it diffuses. And we realize that it's not just for people in business to learn about entrepreneurship. But I would say in the uh, since, since about 2000, we can see across the universities, uh, there's a sense of, well, people in different disciplines uh, could be in biology, the sciences, could be in engineering. Uh, entrepreneurship programs are very big. It's all about teaching the skills to be an entrepreneur to these different fields. So it's actually kind of diffused from one little ghetto in a business school now to being much more prevalent in, in universities. We're seeing this transition, I think, all, every place in the world. But I think there's even more to it in the entrepreneurial university. And that is people who are going to be successful in an entrepreneurial society are going to do better if they have the skills to understand the force of entrepreneurship and entrepreneurial thinking. And in that sense, it becomes a topic for people to it's it's like learning english it's a it's a it's a it's a skill that people learn to be successful whatever their field whatever their endeavor because we're now in a society where entrepreneurship is uh, uh the word is ubiquitous ubiquitous it's every place so what that means for entrepreneurship education i think i think it struggles be, to get out of that original ghetto it's for very special people in business schools who want to be entrepreneurs. To actually, it's for anybody who wants to be a thought leader in management, in policy, uh, uh, almost in any aspect of society. That that's what I see as the evolution of education. Um, thank you, thank you very much for your um, for your um, for your uh, answer. Um, I. I think that we have also a lot of questions, but for the moment, it is <laughs> we we don't have um, um, in, enough time to to speak about uh, other uh, other question, and it 
it could be uh, very interesting, for example, to speak about the social um, uh, inequality generated by the uh, entrepreneurial society, because everybody cannot uh, become a successful uh, uh, entrepreneur. And if we see in the United States, for example, the, the poverty is more um, uh, developed that in Europe or in France, for, for example, because the social um, role of the state uh, is not so uh, developed that he, he, in France. But um, I think also that it is another question, and I don't know if we have enough time to speak about uh, this, uh, this topic. And uh, I don't know I, if um, anybody um, uh, have another question uh, for, the, um, for David, do, uh, Marcos or Daniele. You don't have another question? No? Then. And then. Uh, uh, Jean Claude, if, if it's possible. Ah, Jean yes, Jean Claude. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Uh, I'm Jean Claude Ruano Borbalan from the uh, National Art and Craft Conservatory uh, in France. Um, only a small question. You, you talk uh, about entrepreneurship. If, if, if it was. Uh, uh, like uh, the the two and a half century uh, pedagogical way that we call active methods, but uh, active methods come from um, um, teachers, come come from communities, and absolutely not from the the companies, the <clears throat> the, the business schools, which uh, doesn't know it and. Uh, uh, all the discourse coming from the business schools come from from um, another point of view. I, I, I don't want to characterize this point of view, but you can imagine what I think about that. But how do you, how could you manage a, a, in your discourse uh, the the entrepreneurship education as an emancipation education, as an active and collaborative education, not fulfilled for entrepreneurship in the narrow sense you mentioned. And um, uh, yeah, I, I very much appreciate that that question, Jean-Claude. I'm looking for my, um, uh, I can't find, I'm sorry. Um, oh, there it is. Um, uh, I very much share your, your view. And if you look at the definition, in fact, that's almost the different the distinction between the entrepreneurial entrepreneurial economy, which is descriptive. I mean, in some ways, it's reflecting statistical correlations. Where we see a lot of it, there's positive performance. The bottom is more the causality. And notice that's not about businesses, the bottom, the entrepreneurial society, which I'm defending my book that Sophie put up. That's about the first word is institutions, cultures, and policies, support of an entrepreneurial driven economy. Uh, uh, now, in some ways, uh, I probably share your view that as I would um, uh, uh, put the focus more on, uh, on, on liberty or liberation and liberation uh, in inquiry, liberation from what? From the past. If I go back, to this picture that I like a lot. It's of course not mine from Wikipedia. Uh, Jean-Claude, like Daniela and myself, it appears that you also remember the second industrial era, right? You're like, like Daniela and I were products. And I think that liberation, because uh, I think everything we learn pretty much at the university, in our education and in culture was imprinted from the second in the first, you know, uh, industrial eras, or just say eras. But meanwhile, when we learned it, it was actually in the third. And this is the way, so when I say liberation, probably what that liberation means is to move away from the formulas, the thinking, the assumptions of the past. And because that's what entrepreneurship is, when you really get into the field of entrepreneurship, gets back to uh, what Blondine asked about, well, what is entrepreneurship? The real researchers say, oh, it's about 
opportunities in acting on opportunities. That's about liberation. And at some point, once it merges into philosophy, we no longer have a field, which is okay. But it's my long meandering answer to say, no, we're probably kindred spirits. And I see this as evolutionary uh, uh, from, from going from this second era that I'm a product of. It just was not spoken about, was not, it didn't seem to be important. To then it became important. And now it's probably uh, evolving what that means. I just want to say about Sophie's, because it links up to Sophie's question. I think your point, and I don't want to say I'm an advocate of the entrepreneurial society any more than I'm an advocate of the COVID virus. I mean, this is what's happening. We can try to explain why. We can try to explain responses. So what Sophie puts her finger on, it seems like with this entrepreneurial society, we're seeing it, yes, of course, in my country, but we see it in all the European countries. This, you know, we can see it in this picture of the income distribution, right? Right there. This spreading out, that's the US, but we'd see it in France, we'd see it in the Nordic countries, we see it every place. We can't see the entrepreneurship, but what we can see is the human capital. And we know to, you would say, valorize. I just learned that word the other day, uh, to valorize the human capital. It seems to have to uh, be liberated from traditional applications to new applications, which has something to do with innovation. But Sophie's point is, what about the people who aren't part of this? And there we see the gap, the social problems. Uh, I would probably boldly posit, hypothesize that the insurrection on the Capitol in Washington on January 6th has something to do with what Sophie said, this increasing gap, so that this emergence of whether you call it the entrepreneurial society or just the fourth industrial era, this change, I mean, it's good, it's bad, it's whatever, but it certainly brings a whole new set of challenges. We didn't think about John Cloud when way back, I'm not going to pick a year with Daniel, but back when the lines were all closer together, uh, I think what maybe people get nostalgic and say, let's make, uh, let's make Paris great again. Uh, I don't know if I want to say they're thinking of those lines, but being close together. But a consequence of our, our contemporary world is this challenge that Sophie mentioned. I don't have solutions. I think this is what's going to be the valued, valuable ideas going into the future. That's a long answer. Not a very good answer to a great question. But like you, Jean-Claude, I'm a professor. I like questions better than answers. <laughs> You, you speak as uh, Schumpeter at the end of the capitalist, uh, uh, capitalism, socialism, and democracy. He said, um, I, I can say that the capitalist uh, system will collapse, but I, I have not agree. I, am, uh, I, am, I don't agree with this idea, but it is. <laughs> so you, we, can, um, uh, we can observe the, the uh, economic and social facts uh, and to develop um, maybe some conclusion but also we don't know what we will be the, the future of the of your uh, society <laughs> so, um, thank you very much for your presentation which was very 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 uh, interesting i am sure that we have uh, um, again um, other question but we have to finish <laughs> uh, now the, the conference. Thank you so much, uh, David, for your presentation, which was very, very uh, in, interesting. Thank you thank, very much. <laughs> thank you, Sophie. Thank you, Blondine. And thank you to the uh, participants. And au revoir. <laughs>